Kaka'ulo Ke'eli Kolani has a diverse group of graduates from its bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs. These students come from Hawaiian-focused tracks and its other Indigenous-focused tracks, too. This panel will focus on activities of graduates on behalf of justice. And joining us for this discussion are graduates Ka'iu Kimura, Pele Harmon, and Yota Cabral. Aloha nui oko, mahalo nui ki vala'o ana. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to give it some time for these panelists to jump on screen. Um, and as they do, uh, one of the first things that I'll ask them to um, talk about is just a little bit introduction about themselves. And as I see Kayu pop up on the screen, maybe we'll start off with her, then go to Yota and end with Pele. Um, so if you can just share a little bit about yourself, um, how do you connect with the overall effort uh, to language revitalization and indigenous language revitalization? Um, you know, what is the work that you're doing? How did you get involved with this? And kind of what keeps you going in this practice? Hi, aloha nui kako, uh, mahalo kuule for the, those ni now. Um, uh, like Kuule said, my name is Kayuki Mura. I am a graduate and still current student of Kahaka Ula Okeerikolani. I got both my bachelor's and master's degrees through Kahaka Ula uh, in Hawaiian language and literature, and I am a current PhD candidate uh, finishing off my uh, dissertation, well, working on my dissertation. Um, but prior to that, I joined the Hawaiian language movement um, probably right after high school, graduating from Kamehameha and entering Kahakaula as a freshman. Um, I, you know, began working for Ahapuna Naleo, supporting the classroom and supporting the office work. Um, I also supported some of the instruction and, and teachers at Nabahi during that time, Kepula o Nabahi Okolani Opu'u. And right away, I saw the big difference between my own educational schooling and the experiences that I saw through the classrooms and out of the classrooms at both Punanaleo and Nabahi. Um, and so that I think really helped to anchor my commitment to what we are all striving to do. And that is to renormalize our Hawaiian language, um, having it thrive throughout Hawaii once again. So um, that's sort of my educational pilina to the Okahi and the movement. Um, I am currently the director of Imiloa Astronomy Center, which is also um, a result of the efforts of the Hawaiian Language Consortium um, to expand the use of our Olalo Hawaii outside of the classroom and into the community, working with partners who are um, who we would like to help us expand our Hawaiian language usage as well through the efforts of science, business, and other educational institutions as well. Um, but through that effort, um, we continue to seek the renormalization of our Olalo. Hi, aloha ho, kako. My name is Jason Cabral, also known as Yota. Uh, I am also a product of uh, Kahakaula Oke'eli Kolani. I have my bachelor's here in uh, Hawaiian studies. Um, I went through the first cohort of the Kahua Viola program for the teacher uh, licensing. Uh, I also have my uh, MA from here in Hawaiian language and culture, no, Hawaiian language and Mo'okalaleo literature, uh, re, Hawaiian language and literature. And my PhD also is from Kahaka'ula Kekulani in Hawaiian language and Hawaiian and indigenous language and culture revitalization. Um, I am a professor here at the university right now at Kahaka'ula Kekulani. I am the current, um, what is that in English? The, academic division chair of our program. Um, I teach mainly Hawaiian language and uh, Hawaiian linguistics based courses uh, from the VA level all the way up to the uh, graduate level courses in our MA and our PhD programs. Um, I started out uh, in Hawaiian language um, basically to uh, join some of my teammates who were on the basketball team here at the university. They were taking Hawaiian language and I um, wanted to uh, see what, you know, what they're doing, what they're talking about, you know, such a, such a good 
class that they were in, and I wanted to be a part of that. But before that, um, I'll go back to a little bit of history. I went, I went to Lapuehoe Elementary and High School here on the Big Island. I grew up uh, in Ookala, which is in the border between o, uh, Hilo and Hamakua. And when I was in the um, eighth grade, I was in an English class. And our teacher back then was a person who moved here from the mainland. And uh, that's when uh, DOE started cracking down on pidgin, Hawaiian Creole English in the schools. And uh, I remember her saying in the eighth grade that if you continue to speak pidgin, uh, the only jobs that you're going to be able to have is being a truck driver in the sugar plantation because where I grew up is a sugar plantation uh, area. And I was looking around the classroom. Uh, when first me, my father was a truck driver in the plantation. And then I looked around the classroom and everybody in the classroom, their parent, their fathers mainly worked for the plantation. And uh, I felt uh, uneasy about the way she was talking about that's the only job, like it was maligning uh, a certain group of people for the way they spoke. So from then on, um, I always had this rebellious attitude towards education, uh, trying to um, change the way we speak, change and malign the way uh, we grew up, the way we were raised, uh, the people that were surrounding me. So um, when I started taking Hawaiian language classes, I saw a relationship between pidgin, uh, Hawaiian Creole English, and Hawaiian, uh, being that Hawaiian Creole English came from the Hawaiian language. And uh, I always had this thing inside of me that I wanted to do something that will keep Hawaii as Hawaiian as possible, uh, as well as rebelling against what my eighth grade English teacher told me, saying that only job you can get if you don't speak proper English is being a truck driver. So this whole time I've wanted to uh, prove her wrong, sort of, kind of. And uh, not just that, but also when I started working in the program, I realized how important it is to uh, keep the Hawaiian language going, not um, for the, the kids coming up. I didn't want them to feel uh, uneasy about being Hawaiian because it just seemed to be going in that direction. Like, uh, you need to be more American. We, you need to be more uh, English-based in speaking and way of thinking. And I wanted to prove that wrong. <laughs> I wanted to keep uh, Hawaiian, uh, Hawaii as Hawaiian as possible and have the students be uh, successful in that, being themselves, speaking their language, being comfortable in the way that they were they were raised by their families and in their communities. And I think uh, we've had some success because on my panel, I have two of my students, Ka'iu and Fele, who are doing uh, great work in their, uh, their jobs. But what I'm most proud of them is that they're um, raising their children speaking Hawaiian, raising their families in a Hawaiian valued uh, situation. Uh, so. That's what, one of my biggest goals, keeping Hawaiian as Hawaiian as possible. And as, as Kay Howell said earlier, keeping the Maori Hawaiian, the Hawaiian life force uh, alive and well, and to uh, create opportunities for these types of students to and people who want to pursue this uh, lifestyle that they can be successful in whatever they do. So that is uh, my little story. Mahalo e kule. Hi, aloha kako, ovo o pele honua mea harmen, uh, ke um, hiki ke ike ayo wau ma kaina uh, ulu vehi vehi o hilo iki a manawa. Um, aloha, I'm very um, happy to be with you. My name is pele honua mea harmen. Um, most of my students call me kumu pele and I pare ke kula ona vehi o kulani o pu'u. Um, now it's, I was just trying to um, figure it out. This is my 19th year at Navahi. Um, I am a graduate of Kahakaulo Kielikolani, a very proud graduate and a student of Yota. He was a very good Komo and he, he um, um, remains a very um, good mentor for my, my Ohana. Um, and um, like he said, we 
I have, um, I graduated with my BA from Kahakaolo Ke'elikolangi. I went on to get my teaching um, certification through Koko Viola. And I'm also a um, graduate of the um, Hawaiian Language and Literature um, Master's program as well through Kahakaolo. Um, besides being a kumu, a teacher, um, actually at all different levels of Namahi, I started at the elementary and I also worked at the high school and um, currently I'm kind of focusing on the middle school um, area, uh, but we also, my husband is um, a professor at Kahakolo uh, Ke'elikolani and we have four children who um, we have um, raised, uh, our oldest is a graduate of both the Punana Leo Hilo as well as um, Navahi, um, Kekula O Navahi Kalani Apu, and she will be graduating this year, um, this June, in fact, um, from Dartmouth College. Um, our son is going to be a senior. Um, he is a senior. He'll be graduating from Kekula O Navahi Kalani Apu this year, and we have a junior, and then we have a preschooler who are doing it all over again with. Um, at the Punana Leo Ohilo currently, she um, she is a student there. So much like um, Kaiu and uh, Yota, uh, being educated and being in an environment uh, that Hilo lends itself to, um, surrounded by very um, knowledgeable and um, um, passionate people about keeping Hawaii um, Hawaiian, but also um, reclaiming our language and making sure that it is um, a viable and living language for um, our generation and future generations. Um, I, we've been very blessed to have um, been a part of these programs and to have our children raised by not just our colleagues and our teachers, but also um, um, people who have become family to us. And so, um, my upbringing, I, I was raised on Oahu, not in Ookala, like uh, Yota, not in Waimea, um, in the city, the thick of it. And yet I was very much surrounded by um, um, my language and culture because of uh, my upbringing with my kupuna, my elders um, in church, especially um, at an old, uh, old Hawaiian church on Cook Street um, that still was giving the sermon and still actually um, continues giving sermons in um, Olala Hawaii in our, in our native language and then also um, dancing hula. So that was a big part and it remains a big part of our um, life today. And my husband and I also um, have a hula hala, a, a school in which um, that was named by Larry Kimura, Halawi Kaleo Ola Ola Mamo, and we teach all of our students um, through the medium of Hawaiian. And so that's another way in which we um, want to use our cultural practices and take the our language outside of just the normal school day, but also in um, in our cultural, um, as pro cultural pr practitioners. So, lava paha kela no komanava, mahalo nui. Mahalo nui, Aoko. What wonderful introductions. Um, and I kind of want to have you folks dive a little bit deeper, um, you know, in that brief introduction, we found out that Kayu and Pele are makua or parents raising their keiki, um, that Yota is a rebel, <laughs> um, but wanting to, you know, find ways to advocate for Hawaiian language and our Hawaiian way of being. So I, I have a question for you folks. Um, you know, there are, there are many practices that you do um, since graduating Kaka'ula um, with your undergraduate and, you know, continuing on to different degrees. What is maybe one highlight point, one key um, maybe experience or turning point that you've uh, witnessed in your path since graduating uh, where there's a shift happening for Olalo Hawaii um, advocacy, revitalization, normalization in the community and the work that you folks are doing, uh, whether that be through academic or policy or even in the community within your own families. Um, and I'm going to start off again back with Kayu and then Yota and Hiki Oike Pani e Pele. Hiki no, mahalo kelani no. You know, back in 2000, the year 2000, Kahakaula was asked to participate in building this center that would today be known, would, you know, now is known as Iniloa. Um, and the mission of that center was to build a science center, exhibitions, planetarium, educational programs, 
that would center on the uniqueness of Mauna Kea to both the Hawaiian community and Hawaiian um, traditions, as well as modern astronomy, given that Mauna Kea is home now to astronomical research um, that's international in nature, uh, which has caused tension, right, in our community for the the development of this science um, on Mauna Kea. And the college um, at that time, we I know there was a lot of discussions, but Larry Kimura, who was also my uncle, and Pilo Wilson, Helena Silva and others were having the conversation about whether or not the college should engage uh, to build this center. And ultimately, um, the college chose to engage and to participate in building, mainly because one, we have students, faculty, staff, that have familial connections to this place, to Mauna Kea. Um, and so to represent those connections and those relationships was really important. Um, and two, to, you know, to be at the table to help make decisions for a place that would become a resource to the community. Um, but probably most importantly uh, was the, the opportunity to build a center that would be fully bilingual and offered through our Hawaiian language. Again, focusing on our goal of renormalizing Olalo Hawaii throughout Hawaii and supporting our Hawaiian speaking families outside of the school while also encouraging more, right, to hopefully want to learn Hawaiian language. Um, so we embarked and I think I was just, I was a master's student at the time and we, I was taken as a support researcher to um, Larry to help build the center took us five years to build. And within those five years, um, it was very challenging because for the first time, probably scientists, educators from outside of our Hawaiian medium education uh, pathway and ourselves were sitting around a table trying to figure out how to build this center. And we all agreed on the ultimate mission of the center, but we didn't agree on how to get there. Um, and there was even disagreement on it being a bilingual center offered in both Hawaiian language with English translations. So it was, uh, it was a battle to say the least, um, language being one of the main battles because it would have you know, extended timelines to develop exhibits and content. It would have ex increased budgets because you have to develop everything dually in, in two languages. So there wasn't, there simply was the response to us that, well, um, there isn't enough time and there isn't enough budget to develop a bilingual center. And by the way, there's not the demand for Hawaiian language use and Hawaiian language speakers to justify the extension of time and the extension of budgets. So we actually, um, we actually left the project for a little bit because we just could not agree with those, um, with the administration in that direction at that time. And, because of a lot of pressure put on the leadership at the time of the center, we were actually asked and required, we asked to come back. Um, but the only way we were gonna come back is if one, it was going to be on our terms regarding Hawaiian language. And two, we just, we didn't want Hawaiian knowledge, Hawaiian theory, Hawaiian culture to just be the decorations on the wall, which a lot of discussions were about, you know, come on, you can't tell me that Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian beliefs are the same as scientific theory and scientific discovery, right? So there was sort of this misalignment in understanding um, our universal connections. And there was sort of a denigration, if you will, of our cultural perspectives on that. So we had to work through a lot of those conversations. And ultimately, I will say what brought the, the planning team together, meaning the scientists, and the Hawaiian uh, experts together was our language. Because when we came back, we had to put our foot down and uh, say it will be bilingual. So when we came back with that agreement understood, uh, we had to sit and talk with the astronomers and figure out language that would accurately convey the content that they were wanting to put in the center. We had to create, I think there was over 200 words that Larry and the lexicon committee created. Um, to support uh, more of the astronomical research. Um, and in that process, you had this amazing um, conversations that happened between scientists and Hawaiian language experts that really began to shed light on the complexity and the beauty of Hawaiian language, Hawaiian thought and our process, as well as the scientific language thought and process. And I think that started to forge some really um, 
solid relationships, which then made working together much easier. Even though we still disagreed on things, um, at least having a base of commonality where we all could, could agree um, was, was a really important start for building better understanding and better relationships. So, um, you know, since that time of building the center, we opened in 2006. Uh, since then, over a million and a half people have come through the doors of Imi Loa and experienced the programs at Imi Loa, all, you know, getting introduced to Hawaiian language. Um, we now have our Nabahi Okulani Opu'u juniors and seniors interning and taking courses through Imi Loa and Kahaka Ula to develop skills in media development. And in that, um, they're meeting with scientists, they're meeting with some of the partners that Imi Loa has been able to cultivate over the years that are outside of our Hawaiian speaking community. And those students are creating content and other learning experiences that will then be available through the center for the public using Hawaiian language, but also these students are having a profound impact on our community partners and in particular our scientists. So through some of the programs that we have, which I know you'll hear about later on today, there's a panel discussion about specifically about these programs. Um, we have students contributing to international science. They are our Navahi students are naming discoveries, they're engaging with scientists, um, they're engaging with engineers in the pursuit of astronomy, right? And they are um, learning from them, but they are also contributing to the professionals, their perspective and our language, most importantly. And it's impacting them in ways such that the scientists are becoming advocates for Hawaiian language usage amongst themselves and their colleagues. We had a course offered where over a hundred um, astronomy professionals paid tuition, paid for the books and actually went through a whole course in Hawaiian language. Um, but that is a direct result of them working with our Navahi students. The, um, the naming and the projects that, that they're working on, scientists are now advocating at the international level that science um, in their formal adoption of astronomical discoveries, that the major discoveries coming from Mauna Kea be um, named and represented through the Hawaiian language. And our Navahi students and our Kahaka Ula students are having direct impact on that um, on an international scale. So those I think are some major yet, you know, um, in process, I think Lanakila or wins that we've experienced thus far in expanding our partnerships to the scientific community in particular. And that body of work is also now being cited in major policy um, documents that are coming out. So this year, or last year, I should say, for the first time ever, um, the, a decadal survey is put out every 10 years, which sets up the United States priorities for astronomical research. For the first time in history, the 2020 decadal survey now references Ahua Heinoa, the Hawaiian language programs that we're doing with our Navahi and Kahakaula students. And the important thing about that is that it is setting into policy and funding priorities, the need to support more, not only Hawaiian language, but indigenous language work in the astronomy field across the nation for the next 10 years. So it's a small start, but it is a huge win in the sense that we, we're not claiming that as directly and singly um, being done because of specifically only our project. Project. But our projects and our work are definitely contributing to a shift in a national and even international scale as it relates to science and how science engages with indigenous communities. So um, those are some of the things I think about when I, when I hear your question, Kuule, that I wanted to share. Mahalo. Oh yeah, mahalo. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, a shift I've seen uh, here at the university when I started teaching here back in 1995, 28 years ago, uh, when I first started, there was only uh, one type of first year Hawaiian language, Hawaiian 101 and 102. Uh, however, in those years after, there's, there was started to be a lot of uh, Hawaiian being taught in Hawaiian, uh, in public schools and also private schools here in Hawaii. And so, so when those students started coming to the university, they already had a background. So we had to change the way we taught first year to accommodate those types of students. 
And then fast forward a few years later, when uh, first graduates from like Navahi in I believe 1999 was the first year they graduated, I think. Uh, when students that had immersion backgrounds started coming to university, we had to revamp the way we started teaching uh, uh, first year. So we started with 101 and 102. Then we created 103 and 104, 203 and 204 to accommodate those students who had background uh, backgrounds in Hawaiian language at the high school level. Uh, and then when we started having those graduates from immersion schools and uh, in medium schools come into our program, we created another track for first year and second year, 133 and 233. Uh, and those courses, they taught the same lessons as regular first and uh, second year courses, but it was all through Hawaiian. And it was more of a cleaning up their grammar when they came into school because they could already speak, they could already understand, they could write and all of that, but uh, they just needed to be uh, helped out a little bit uh, in the kalai lai, the analy analyzing language, because when they were in uh, at those uh, medium Hawaiian medium schools, they kind of learned through being, through doing, and it just kind of you know, got in, uh, into them not by really uh, analyzing home. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that none of them did like that, but I'm sure there are some who analyzed Hawaiian language, but most of them, for the most part, didn't really think about learning. They just did it and with the, and learned it by doing with the teachers and the, and the school. So that was one of the shifts that I've seen uh, in these uh, past 25 or so years teaching, uh, how Hawaiian language has grown uh, in high schools. Uh, from Punana Leo and all the way through the high schools and the different types of students that we've had to come through our programs. Another shift that I've seen uh, is, and I'm very proud of, like I mentioned earlier about these two panelists with me, is I've seen uh, some, I started teaching at Navahi as well back in 1995 and I taught there for 10 years. And then when I see some of my students come back into the program, going to Kahua Viola, getting their teacher's licensing, uh, and they start getting back into the Punanaleo, starting getting back into uh, Nawahi and different Hawaiian medium schools as teachers. Uh, I'm starting to see that shift as well, where these students are starting to give back to what uh, to the schools that raised them, you know, for when they're kids. And I think uh, when those types of students go back in, they have more of a connection to the school, and it makes it more of a, a better. Uh, I want to say better, a better, but a more a deep connection that they have with the school. So it's more Ohana family ingrained, and uh, they're more able to, uh, the students, when they have those type of teachers, I went to your school as well. I went to this school and went to what you have been through. So, you know, I think the students now have, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain that. They have more of a trust, I guess, because when I first started teaching Navi, I was the outsider coming in and they were like this tight knit group of kids, you know? And so it was a struggle in the beginning to gain their trust. But now when they started going back into school and I see them uh, scolding the kids nowadays, hey, speak only Hawaiian. Not, that's the same thing I was scolding them to do. You know, I see this, they come back uh, full circle. So those are the two shifts that I've seen. Uh, from when I started teaching back then in 1995. Mahalo. Oh, um, I think for all of us, um, especially those that are involved in um, the Hawaiian language, um, um, we're always in the thick of it. And so it's very hard to kind of say like, oh, you know, we're not very celebratory. I I think it comes to it because it, you can always do better. Yeah, you're always striving to um, improve or um, thinking about how the world is changing and how do we hold fast to these things that are so important to us and yet um, adapt to meet the needs of our communities today. And so that was a really loaded question. I would say um, because my um, chosen career career path has been um, through education. It's been very important um, throughout my 19 years at Navahi to um, constantly work on um, improving the curriculum, but also keeping an ear to the ground as far as um, uh, paradigm shifts in the educational 
um, world, especially in Hawaii. And, you know, um, during the, my tenure at Navahi, we've had to go through standardized testing and then um, um, and in English class, um, in English language. And then um, there was a haphazard um, Hawaiian language test that was created. And then um, that wasn't, that wasn't, um, I guess, scientifically sound in the minds of um, people at the state level because our kids did really well at it. <laughs> and so then it was, you know, back to the drawing board and um, there have been so many shifts and yet um, staying true to what is, um, what is important for curriculum, um, to have in our curriculum at our Hawaiian medium schools, not just the language, but also um, the kinds of relationships and the way we interact with people. And so I think um, that has made, I have seen a, a big shift, like how, how Yota said when, um, you know, it's not for the people hearted at all to work in Hawaiian medium schools. I mean, it's a lot of extra work and a lot of time and you really have to love, um, and believe in the community and the overall goal of um, perpetuating our language and our culture. And so um, there were a lot of, I think, shifts in our teaching staff for a few years. And then now I feel like we have a really solid um, team of teachers and alumni that are coming back. And um, they do give a sense of continuity, but a, a different kind of pride because I myself, I'm not a graduate of um, Hawaiian medium schools. I did graduate from an English medium school and then um, um, became a teacher. And so I see um, the strength like of character and also um, just the determination of these alumni that come back and um, are actually teachers to me as well because they attended school when it was not popular to do so, when there was a lot of doubt and I'm not saying that that's totally gone, but I feel like the graduate saints um, have really helped to educate not just our families and our friends and our own communities, but um, Hawaii at large and then internationally as well. Um, people that you can be raised in your language, you can stay true to what is important to your um, culture, your family, your community, and also be very successful in um, in academics, in um, athletics, in whatever uh, path you choose um, in the workplace, because embedded in our language and in our culture are things like perseverance and um, work ethic and respect and thinking of others um, besides just thinking of yourself. And so, um, all of these things as an educator and as a parent and as a Hawaiian makes me very, very um, excited and very happy. And then I also, um, on the flip side of that, I'm always thinking like, oh, gosh, well, how can we do better? You know, like it's not enough. I feel like oh, I, I can, you know, when my students don't reach that goal, then I always um, take that to heart and feel like I need to do a better job at um, um advocating for them or um, finding out opportunities in which to grow them. And so I would say, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're coming along. Uh, we have a long way to go. Um, and just the way that we are at Navahi, it's no ane'i Coca-Cola. And so our students, my children, um, we realize that um, Hawaii is our home. It's given us all of this wealth of knowledge and um, a rich culture, a rich language, um, natural beauty. And so um, we have to go out into the world and bring back to our people and to our homeland. Um, we have to contribute to this place. And so, um, because this is a place that has given us so much. And so I think that is still a very strong um, um, mindset of all of our graduates. And, um, um, and so, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I, I feel like, um, yeah, I didn't change policy or law, but, um, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're working towards a common goal um, in, the, um, in the school as well. Mahalo. 
Mahalo Nuye Pele. And I'm sure advocacy work is beyond uh, legislative action as well. It happens in our communities too. So Mahalo Nuye for the work that you do, um, that all three of you do actually. And we are towards the end of this panel discussion, but there were three questions that came in that I want um, to address. Um, so maybe we can start off with uh, one for Pele. Um, this is in regards to children um, and if there's a strong desire for them to learn their language as a Kumu at Navahi um, and you know you're you're Kiki as well interacting with others who may or may not uh, grow up speaking Hawaiian language what is your take on this younger generation and their desire to learn their language and culture um, and even with adults too do they feel the same way in this desire to olalo Hawaii and, and what happens if there are engagements with people who might not be as supportive of Hawaiian language revitalization efforts? Good question. Um, I, you know, my um, experience has always been that people are way more supportive than they are um, adversive when it comes to um, our language and, um, I think there was on a panel earlier today, but she is one of my daughters and, and um, it's always interesting because when they were young, because they only spoke Hawaiian to them at home, uh, we would be like followed, um, stopped in, you know, grocery stores and people are just trying to figure out like, what language are they speaking and how are these kids just so fluent at such a young age? And so um, I think when they're young, you know, we just kind of force them into it. But what's very rewarding as a parent is that my kids are now, so my son is a 17 and my, um, you know, I have a 21 year old and then a 16 year old. And um, then when we had our fourth child, so who just made three, <laughs> um, big gap. Um, and, you know, she was about turning two years old and, and then the older, the teens were like, mom, like, are, are, did you get started on, you know, um, her, um, filling out registration papers and you know isn't she going to go to school and and I, I kind of turned to them and I said okay so after all of this you know you guys are teens you're young adults after all of this I mean being thrown into um, everything that your father and I put you through um, all these levels of education and then also um, attending uh, university courses as high schoolers um, what if we do something different with your younger your younger sibling? And they were so adamant about like, ah, ole loa. You know, that means no way, mom. She needs to go to um, um, Punalaleo. And so, um, as a parent, it really made Kiko and I, my husband, um, very thankful that um, they see the value in their language and they want that for their um, younger sibling, you know, teens sometimes they're a little um, immature in their way of thinking, but there was no question when it came to their younger sibling that um, she needed to have um, our language and that she needed to be raised in the kind of environment that they were raised in because they have very good um, uh, memories of that. And so I feel like the young people today, they do understand, of course, they're going to go through their things and, you know, with globalization and social media and all of these other things, um, it, it, it is difficult sometimes to go against the grain. Um, I've noticed that with our younger teens, more so than my older daughter, because she was just very isolated in her, I mean, um, these programs were definitely her family, her network. And so she was right up until she was about five years old she thought everybody should speak Hawaiian like we live in Hawaii why don't why are these people speaking a different language to me and so um I I still feel like there's a very strong pool of all of our people towards wanting that um, wanting to reclaim our language now the actual putting in the work and sometimes it does get very difficult in today's um, um day and age so I know that even in just little ways my my kids have become those that say the pule the prayer before their um, athletic events or um people just expect them like okay you're going to give a speech at a huge um in, in front of a huge game or a huge then they expect that they're going to say it in hawaiian 
and then kind of summarize it in English. And and I I like that that is um, expected of of them from other people, but that's also their choice as individuals, as young adults, to make sure that everybody knows where they come from and what their language is and that they're very proud of that. And so um, even in English medium situations. And so I, I think there's a lot of support out there and um, that's why our programs constantly are growing. Yeah, mahalo. Mahalo Nui. Um, I definitely agree. You know, creating the community that brings up these uh, keiki, uh, myself being one of those who were brought up, Yota didn't mention, but he was also my kumu. <laughs> as well. Um, so really creating that type of environment to support one another and make it such that it is not weird or different, but that it is, you know, part of everyday life. And that goes to um, another question that we had. Um, this one is for Yota. I'm talking about, you know, the word renormalization. Uh, I think that word has been uh, brought up in past years for this conference. Um, and if you can talk a little bit about the difference between the word revitalization and normalization or renormalization, and what do we mean by that when we use those words for Olalo Hawaii? Hmm, it's a good question. Can I phone a friend? No. Um, I don't know, they kind of mean the same things to me, sort of. Um, so revitalizing, I guess, is the action of providing a uh, providing pathways to keep a language going, uh, to keep it alive. Whereas renormalizing means it's alive and try to put it into our everyday lives. Um, I think for us, it's not just about the, the language being renormalized, it's also the uh, way of life. And for us, uh, Keiki spoke earlier about the Kumu Honua Mauliola and uh, how that's our uh, educational philosophy that we follow and it's and the Hawaiian language is an integral part of that. Um, but there are also other aspects of our Maoli, our life force, uh, including our um, spirituality, uh, the way we behave, our kinesiology, uh, the way uh, our bodies act, and um, our cultural knowledge. So renormalizing, I think, uh, entails all of those aspects as well. It's not just keeping a language alive, but it's also keeping a language alive in our everyday lives, the way we conduct ourselves uh, at work, the way we conduct ourselves within our families. And I think for us, the most, in, well, for me, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think some people have the same ideas that I do. Um, it's important for you know, our kids when they come to our program here at the university to get their degree MA, BA, MA, PhD, whatever it may be. But I think more importantly, it's to build their character, build their Hawaiian way of thinking, the Hawaiian way of being uh, as a community. And I think renormalization um, comes with that. It's not just the language, oh, some people can speak it, but you can speak it and use it in a place uh, of value whether we work, whether it's be raising your family, uh, the way we interact as a community. I think that's the renormalization part of it, to make it a commonplace. Uh, so when people come and they hear Hawaiian, they're not surprised and be like, oh, what are you speaking? Is that Samoan? I don't know. It's, it's a rel relative of Samoan. <laughs> Hawaiian, and it's, uh, this is the place uh, where it's supposed to be. So I think revitalization, this is the act of you know keeping it alive. What are some things we can do in the uh, educational system to keep it going, but then renormalization. When it, what do we do when we with the language, with the way of being, with the way we uh, interact with each other, and try to uh, put it into not just in the schooling system in education, but in our families at uh, law, uh, scientific uh, areas of. Uh, knowledge um, in every aspect of life, you know, uh, as hopefully as the Hawaiian language keeps on growing and growing, we're gonna need lawyers to represent these families. We're gonna have 
police officers, firemen, firewomen, fire people who can uh, speak Hawaiian as well. Uh, and we have some. There are people who can. Uh, we have one of our colleagues who got into a bit of an accident and then he heard <laughs> him uh, speaking to his wife in Hawaiian. And the fire person, the EMT, started speaking Hawaiian to him. So that's a big step in normalization, renormalization, I believe. It's not just you know, in the educational program, but in all aspects of life where it becomes a normal thing uh, for people to speak Hawaiian and communicate uh, in, in Hawaiian. And also being, uh, you know, being Hawaiian, the way we interact with each other as a community. So I think that those are the, the differences between revitalizing and renormalizing Hawaiian. Mahalo, Nui. Um, okay, and last question before we move on to the next panel, um, which I will direct back to Kayu. Um, but if any of you want to uh, jump in as well, this one goes to talking about the future. So you folks have mentioned obstacles in the past uh, and ways in which we've seen shifts for revitalizing Olalo Hawaii. What are some of the things that uh, you're seeing now that you didn't see 20 years ago? as obstacles. So I'm going to repeat that one more time. What what do you see now that you yeah. didn't see 20 or more years ago? And maybe we'll just stick to one thing so that we can uh, okay. wrap this up. Yeah. One thing in the context of what I spoke about earlier with the work we've been doing with Emi Law and the scientific community is um, there is now an acceleration in demand for Hawaiian language support. <laughs> And what that means is that, you know, responding to, so for example, going to a conference after announcing um, two major discoveries named in Hawaiian in that process and the students that participated in it, I got flooded after that presentation by many scientists who now want to name everything in Hawaiian language. And um, it, so I, and on one hand, it's a lanakila, it's great to see interest growing. And then on the other hand, it's just the, uh, the capacity um, that we have to respond to these accelerating requests or these growing requests uh, for Hawaiian language support in other domains. So um, that I think is one of the challenges that we face now is, is our own internal capacity and the ability to respond to um, a society that's beginning to see the value and also want the value of Hawaiian language in their domains as well. Um, so that, that's something I see as, as a positive challenge. Nonetheless, it's something that we've got to um, work through. Mahalo Nui. Um, yes, I, I think that, you know, is the same for a lot of other domains, so including education that we, you know, the Hawaiian language started in. Now there's a lot of families and students who want to learn Olalo Hawaii as well throughout the state and being able to develop that workforce to be able to support that type of learning, uh, which you folks can learn more about with Kahua Viola and other work done at Kahaka Ulo Ke'eli Kolani. No Kamanava, mahalo nui yaoko, mahalo ka'iu, yota me pele. Thank you so much for sitting in this panel discussion with us. Mahalo nui. Mahalo, mahalo nui yaoi kumulei.